Changing the Stigma. Uh, this is a show where we talked about mental health and we try to get people to come forward, even veterans come forward when it comes to mental health and what's going on with those barriers as to why they do not come forward. Um, the average suicide rate just for the general population increased from 2000 to 2020 from about 10 per day to about 14 per day. Veterans is much higher. It's around 22 per day. And that number hasn't come down. So we need to continue to work together and get that to, to come down. And a way to do it is to change the stigma behind mental health. And the way we're going to do that is to have an open conversation, have people uh, come on this show, have open conversations about mental health. Um, and there's been a lot of changes going on in the field of mental health and the research behind it. So every now and then you get people that are starting to feel more comfortable to come forward when it comes to mental health. Here, veterans, um, I'm a veteran myself. Uh, my name is James Klein. I'm the host and I am a infantry combat vet between the Marine Corps and the Army, about 13 years between the two. Uh, and when I came back from my last deployment, a 15 month combat tour to Afghanistan, I went to 117 interviews with three college degrees and couldn't get hired. Uh, and so that's kind of the reason why my guest is here today. I'm going to let her introduce herself. Uh, she works with finding employment for veterans. Uh, and we'll kind of get into the conversation about the barriers behind veterans, uh, what they perceive as barriers, uh, what they struggle with, what they think they might be struggling with, and what services are available to help them out with. Uh, so, because a lot of people's identities are with employment and everything we can do to help get these veterans that are vital to our society and community and get them working again, the much more willing they're going to come forward to ask for help for future things. So, uh, Andrea, if you introduce yourself and kind of like your background. Um, yeah, my name is Andrea May and I run the Homeless Veterans Reintegration Grant. We've had that since um, 2006 at Harbor Care, and it's a Department of Labor funded grant. And my job is to help veterans who are homeless or in danger of uh, homelessness. And now we can help VA clients, which is are really great. So we've increased the amount of people we can help. So uh, we can help anybody who has um, other than dishonorable discharge, which it took me years uh, being a non-veteran to realize there was six <laughs> levels. And now we have a lot of uncharacterized. So um, right. I have this great thing, Squares, that I can just look them up now and it will tell me if they're eligible when I can't read those DD-214 some days. <laughs> right. So, yeah. Yeah, especially for the older vets, some of those yep. uh, DD-214s are kind of hard to read sometimes or even understand. Mm -hmm. Maybe they might be missing a page because when you get the discharge paperwork, there's a page two and a page four. And there's a member one and a member four. Right. I just, I so you need member four, right. which has the discharge and stuff on it. So just for the general audience knows, there are multiple discharges when it comes to, uh, especially the enlisted folks. So when it, you're an officer, you're either commissioned or you're not commissioned. That's really how it is. But if you're enlisted, uh, the discharge you want the most is dis you want an honorable discharge. Then you have a general discharge under honorable conditions. Then a general discharge other than honorable conditions. Uh, what's commonly referred to as a BCD or a bad conduct discharge. And then you have the dishonorable. But there's a new one that's been coming around we've been dealt with that you talked about is yep. uncharacterized. Yep. Um, so that discharge actually doesn't do veterans a lot of service because they kind of don't exist. They didn't right. really exist in the military. So they don't qualify for a lot of the benefits. Yeah, that's true. Um, and we have a lot of people who were um, National Guard who were activated that we can help too. As long as they're, okay. they were activated um, by presidential order, then we can work with them because they've served active duty. So, Right, and there's a difference uh, between that Title 32 is active guard um, and they can accrue retirement pay and retirement time, but Title 10 is when they go on active duty orders right. uh, and that's when they incur those benefits. So kind of who qualifies and what are the qualifications for HVRP? So they just have to be a veteran, they have to be homeless or in danger of being homeless. And thank God now we can take VASH and before we couldn't take in danger of being homeless. Okay. So, and I, I love that we can take self attestation now because a lot of people who are living in their car, I mean, who's gonna vouch for that or living <laughs> right. on the park bench, you know? So right. now if, you know, it's really great because back in the day it would have been a boundary to text somebody, but now it's like I yep. use that, they're, they're more open to texting me or emailing and they'll say, yeah, I'm living in my car or I can't pay my rent this week or I don't know where I'm gonna get my rent. Right. And I snapshot that and I put it in their folder and I say, good to go, I'm gonna help you now, so. 
Yeah, because if they're homeless and they're living in a tent somewhere, yeah, uh, they can probably easily access Wi-Fi somewhere, but they may not have phone service because they can't right. pay for it. So that's great that you can be doing texting and the emails and stuff. Yeah, so they get on an internet, so they don't even have to have a plan that way. And a lot of them communicate <laughs> right. with me that way. Yep. Right. They teach me a lot of things, so I learned. <laughs> I learned how are you texting me if you don't have like a, like a service, you know? So. Right. So I know years ago, uh, it was a lot much stricter when it comes to who qualified for the program. Mm -hmm. It used to be, um, you had to have 180 days after duty. Mm -hmm. You had to have an honorable discharge. So what do you see as some of the reasons why uh, the federal government or the VA has loosened up the restrictions to allow more veterans to qualify? I think just because there's such a need and you know, people give me the, the idea that, hey, they signed on the bottom line saying that I'm gonna give you four years of my life. And if something happened that they didn't, you know, make it through for failure, I have a lady who was failure to, I can't think of the word now, just, she just basically couldn't make it through the three months and we're working right. with her and we're helping her. But I mean, she legitimately went in there. She legitimately signed on the bottom line and right. now she's someone in need. So she was willing to give four years of her life for us, but right. it just didn't work out for her where she made it for whatever reason. And I, I see it as like a lot of my veterans, and I don't know because I'm not a veteran, but you know they didn't have um, lives where they really could afford to go to college, right. or they they didn't have money to to you know what am I going to do now? So they joined the service. They right. travel, you get three square meals, and then they come out of the service and they're like, what am I going to do now? I I don't have a regimented thing of what I'm going to do. And they try to go to their family members and a lot of times they're like, oh, you're not the same person. You changed. And, and of course, the service changed. You know, absolutely. The, changes, the service right. changed my nephew that drastically. Right. And I just think that, you know, they were willing to do it for four years. And for whatever reason, their mental health or something didn't work. And, you know, it's good to be able to help more people that right. way, I think. So not being a veteran, um, how did you get into this program? I, mean, I know the answer because yeah. we've been worked together for over five years now, but. Uh, kind of tell the audience how you got well, into it. Well, I worked for Community Council on National Mental Health. Um, now it's National Mental Health. Mm -hmm. And um, I was there for many years doing supported employment. Mm -hmm. And then my boss came over here and she's like, hey, why don't you come over here and work with the veterans? Well, my dad was a veteran. Yep. So I was really excited to be able to work with the veterans. And, and that was um, how we got started. And uh, it's just grown and grown. And it's nice to be able to help them because, like I said, the, you know, they were willing to give four years of their life. And who knows what, what they went through, you know, what kind of uh, traumas they went through right. during that time. Like I said, even if they only were able to make it a year, mm -hmm. I'm really impressed with some of the female veterans that made it, um, you know, five, six, seven years. And I get really excited to help them okay, as well. Great. But it just uh, seems like as much as we try to help them, there's always a barrier. Like the rents are astronomical right now. Right. And if their car breaks down, it's just like one constant bill after another. And I lose total sleep over that night. Like, is this person eating tonight? I have a veteran living in an empty house right now that doesn't have fuel for the winter, you know, and there's okay. always just something. But I, like like you, are going to school, really like to see them go to school. But it kind of works against my grant because if I don't make, you know, quota right. that 19 people get jobs, then I won't have the funding to help them next year. Right. So, and I have to get placements or we don't get the money again next year. So I try to work it as, let's do one or two classes. Let's try that first. And I actually right. had a veteran come see me after 15 years and it was just like amazing. First of all, he said, you're still here. And I go, why does everybody say that? <laughs> Meaning, am I still here because I'm crazy or are they keeping <laughs> right. me? And um, he said that he wanted to be a, a nurse's aide or an LNA. And it's really difficult if you talk to people because most people want a female nurse's aide. Males do, women do. So it's hard. So I told him, well, why don't you go to like, you know, be the person who checks your blood pressure when you come in, checks your weight mm -hmm. and things like that. And he just came by to tell me that he was doing great and had reunited with his daughter. And okay, since yep. he was working and sober that she um, and he said, you never give up on us. You, you push us to the edge. It's tough love. But, you know, you it's accountability. Like right. you got to do this. Like, yes, bad things happen to you right. back there, but we're here. Yeah. So let's go forward. Yeah, and there's a lot of education benefits that are out there to help out the veterans, whether it, you assist them in some classes here and there to help yep. them get a certification or something like that. But I know a program I'm going through is HVR, uh, which is Voc Rehab, yeah. VNRE. Uh, they're helping me pay for my master's degree in social work. Uh, I'm about a year through it. 
Uh, there were some hiccups in there, but it wasn't necessarily the program itself that was the hiccup. Right. Uh, it was actually the colleges because of COVID, things were restricted. They were focusing more on bachelor level classes instead of master level classes. Uh, unfortunately, I was not able to get into UNH, but I got into a great school. It's in the top 10 in the country for uh, social work, Fordham University out of New York City. Great school, great program, no issues. I get great support from my um, uh, employment counselor through VNRE. And you can do uh, everything online? Well, right. Because of the restrictions, I've been doing stuff online. Right. Uh, but now they've lifted it, so I, can, I have the option to do it in person or do it online. Mm -hmm. But again, great program. That way I can give back to veterans. I can start doing counseling down the road. Um, so what are some options that you know of for the veterans to... And it, you don't have to get a college education if you do these education benefits. No, I do on-the-job training. Okay. So if I want my client to get into manufacturing and... I mean, that's a good field for a lot of my veterans because they either worked on airplanes in the service or right. mechanical stuff. And um, there's a lot of great um, manufacturing people in uh, in uh, in uh, Manchester. Okay. And there's like uh, Marmon Air Defense, and they love that because that's like, you know, in their <laughs> field. So they love that working right. there. And um, there's a lot of entry level jobs and things like that. So I just encourage them that it's it's something they might want to try or there's like medical manufacturing they always think that's great. Mm -hmm. So what I'll do is I'll pay the company on the job training for like, you know, five weeks and then I'll okay. say, I know like, it was like me when I used to be a business owner. It's just so hard to take the time to train somebody but you need help but you don't have time to train somebody. Right. So if I'm giving them that extra income, they can pay somebody to train that client that's not taking away from what they need to be get, getting done. Because right. you know what it's like to train somebody. Right. It's like I have to do my job and everything I have to do, but now I have to teach this person how to do it. So it makes my job easier. So it's right. it's difficult. So if I can give, like, I love helping small businesses. If mm -hmm. I can give them a little bit of money. Like we have Keith Levitt. He's a stonemason. Yep. We got Paul a job, and Paul's been doing it for three, four, five years, and he loves right. it. And what a great trade. Like that, that fountain we have outside of our office. Yep. I got a veteran into the stonemason industry, a young guy, and they made that fountain for us. So I wish nice. I could find that picture of all of them in front. But <laughs> right. Yeah, so things like that, that we can help them. With. And then if they don't want to go to the VA, because it used to be you have to have 20% to, to be able to get the VA um, training. Right, itself. so the VNRE, uh, usually it takes you 20% disability rating through the VA to right. qualify for the program. Yep. And the higher rating, the more priority you get. Right. So if you're 70% or higher, uh, you get the first priorities, uh, then 50 to 70, and then 20 to 20 to 50 is kind of how it was explained to me. So. Yeah, so a lot of my clients might not have that or just might have not got the di diagnosis or gone through it. So I use um, the Voc Rehab right in Nashua, and they've been right. great. And uh, Maureen Griffin at New Hampshire Employment Security, she's yep. helped um, pay for classes and yep. trainings too. So. And like NETS, I helped them pay for NETS. I paid for a full course for somebody through two programs, for my program. For the tractor trailer program. driving? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we, I helped him with NETS, and he just finished his class and is ready to take his test. So working with veterans in the employment, my question to you, Andrea, is, um, like I was infantry. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of transferable skills, per mm -hmm. se, to the civilian world. You got leadership, maybe being on time, structure, things like that. You don't have to tell your soldiers a lot. They're already trained on what to do. You don't have to necessarily oversee them all the time. Right. So how the veterans you're working with, are you seeing skills being able to transfer over or is there a kind of a struggle? Um, there is with like the mechanics and air mechanics because there's okay. a huge need for like diesel mechanics, but there isn't a huge need for like putting together weapons or blowing <laughs> things up. So um, <laughs> nobody right. I can think of that, that needs that right now. But right. I mean, I tell them that, you know, some of your skills, like, you might not think they're transferable, but they are. Like, if, if you even did admin in the office, which they make everybody do admin, or it's dealing with customer service or yep. different things. Like, they say, I don't want to put that in my resume, but I said, hey, it shows that you can deal with difficult clients. It shows right. you can deal with customers. Or if you did drywall, there's measuring, taping. I just mm -hmm. saw a job online. It was $100,000 that I'm looking at for one of my veterans because he used to uh, bid jobs and do contracts and say, yep. I can tell you how much this is going to uh, cost. Uh, and it's like a $100,000 a year job. I'm like, geez, I went the wrong way. Uh, <laughs> and he's disabled. And right on the bottom, it said willing to accept disabled veterans. So most of the time you say, you know, you're going to get in there. You're going to need to do the wor work too and pull up your sleeve. Mm -hmm. But they just want someone to go on site and be able to say what this job is going to cost us. Right. 
And he, I think he can do that because right. he's been in the business so long and that would be a perfect job for him because yeah. it's not physical. No, absolutely. But there is, I've had clients that have had jobs like that and sometimes it's just so stressful that they, they have a breakdown over it. You know, they've had mm -hmm. great jobs like that. But, and you know, I, I've sat down with employers too and they're like, it's literally said to me, well, what's wrong with them? And I'm like, the same thing that's wrong with everyone else, anxiety, uh, depression, stress. Right. And you just have to educate them. And when Grey's Anatomy came out where that guy had the PTSD and no. went after his girlfriend, I go, that never happens. Right. Like I've been with clients and I've gotten like, pretty like in their face sometimes saying, you need to go to work, you need to get this together. Like I understand you're having trouble and I right. understand, but we can do this. So it's sometimes just calling them every day saying, you can do this, you can do this, you know, and just talking to them all the time and talking them through it, so. Well, it seems like you're doing a lot of positive stuff out there for the veterans and kind of like I said in the beginning of the show, 117 interviews before I just took a job to take a job uh, with three college degrees. And that's because of the stigma behind veterans. Yeah. Everyone in the public seems to assume that if you're a veteran, no matter what your job was, that you must have been in combat because everything has gone to Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, that you suffer from PTSD and you're going to snap. And I actually had people in interviews come out and tell me it was too soon being back. They weren't going to hire me. They were afraid that you'd go into right. combat mode. Right, that I'm going to snap, something's going to happen. So I was like off limits. So how do you think that makes veterans feel when they're qualified, uh, they're very skilled, and then they have the stigma attached to a mental health issue. Well, do you uh, think part of it might have been that they saw you as someone who was overqualified, that they're going to take the time and money to train you, and you're going to want to move on with all these degrees? Because I know with my legal background that yep. a lot of people wouldn't hire me because they're like, you're a lawyer, why do you want to work here? Right. Well, I was a single mom, and That's my husband right. had passed away, and I need to find a job Monday through Friday because I can't work as a lawyer and do all the nights and weekends and right. everything you have to do to prepare for cases. Right. Now, a lot of places flat out just told me that uh, I did hear the term overqualified sometimes, yeah. uh, but a lot of times it was just too soon being back. And there's not much you can do about it. You can be discriminated against for being a veteran. Yeah. Uh, now, if I said I qualify, that I had some kind of disability, that's a different story. Uh, right. Well, Dan Bricker is really good about yeah. that, and he should educate the public a lot more because he will talk about how to veterans can move for, from the service to civilian life right. and that's a really good class so I think it's just about educating the public that that's not the way it's going to be and I have sat down with many many companies and like my veterans I said ask them ask them why they're not working ask them what their problems are same thing everybody goes through you got kids you got daycare you got anxiety depression right. I said at least with my veteran you know what you're getting and you got me to support you I said, you hire someone right off the street, you don't know if they're doing drugs, you don't know what their history is, I can tell you what this person's history right. is, and I can be there to support that veteran, and they have a lot of supports. So like, you know, our agency has mental health counseling right there. Yep. Everybody could use mental health counseling, <laughs> right. you know? Like, yeah. you know, you work with me, so you might need it now. <laughs> so, um, and I think that, that we're doing a lot for that, right. you know, with our veterans and helping them through, and I get, you know, calls all the time saying, you didn't give up on me, you know, you, even though five jobs later, Right. And uh, no matter what they called me. <laughs> so, uh, right. you know, but it's just, I think we're there to support them. And that, that helps all the, you know, I have right. bosses calling me all the time. Was he really sick this week? Or did he just, you know, what's going on? I'm like, right. no, yeah, he was sick. So. So part of me feels like that kind of under, undermines the, the veterans themselves kind of calling outs. But I great, uh, greatly appreciate the fact that you are advocating out there. And you're just telling everybody that the veterans are the same as everybody else, right. have the same issues. Because um, very few of the population, the veteran population, actually were ever involved in combat right. or even directly in a combat. So I get it. There's a lot of stress if you get shipped over to Germany or yep. Japan or wherever you might yep. be deployed to. But very few of them actually ever saw direct combat. Well, I have this nice cover letter and it says what the military has taught me. And one yep. of the things is do the right thing when nobody's watching, right. which people seem to forget that organizational skills, um, how to work under pressure. I mean, I mean, what kind of pressure that you guys had in the service is not like what we're going to have that you, you could be shot at, you could be killed. You don't mm -hmm. know, you know, so, I mean, that's a lot of things I put in the cover letter. And I was just in a training with Guam last week and that was like we ended at 1030 at night because mm -hmm. the time zone. And the possess it was workforce development, and they yeah. gave me this great little tree. I'll have to send it to you yeah. of what the military has taught this person and why you should hire a veteran. And basically, it's it's they've worked under stress. They can right. work in uh, stressful environments, and 
they are organized and they're, um, you know, like, you know how you guys make your beds. <laughs> so, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and my, my, uh, my sister's uh, boyfriend always says, it starts out with making your bed. There's a great right. general who, who has a little thing about that. So, yeah. I mean, it's just a nice letter. And it came from a female veteran. I went to a Fidelity. Yeah. Fidelity had this big event where they wanted to hire veterans. Right. And she listed everything the military had taught her. And I'm like, can I use that in my cover letters? <laughs> right. And yeah. So. Yeah, so that's some of the services you provide, cover letters, writing resumes, which is huge these days. Yep. Uh, so many companies have programs that weed out uh, resumes by programming itself. Right. Where they, uh, if you don't have certain words, they don't even, the HR person never even sees it. Right. So what's your reception back on uh, how the veterans receive that? Well, when, you know, when I see a job application, it, you look for those key words because they actually, some people have programs that search for those words. Like, so you take the job that you want to go for and you look mm. at what they're asking for. Team player, qualified in, in all the different mm. verbiage that they're using, whether it's a machinist and it's got certain uh, cl collab, I don't even know, calipers <laughs> or right. whatever. Right. And um, I use a lot of ONET when I make their resume. So those buzzwords are in there through New Hampshire Employment right. Security. And so I might not understand the job, but if I go on ONA, and the good thing about ONA is at the bottom, it will tell you, hey, they're going to need 62,000 warehouse workers over the next five years okay. in that position. Yeah. And it will tell you what the median wage will be, and it will tell you what education that you need. Right. So, yeah. So that was one thing that uh, we talked about earlier is the difference between helping veterans find jobs now versus even five years ago. So one difference is computer programs, weeding out resumes, yep. things like that. Mm -hmm. So what are some other differences? Uh, you know, there. It, it, the one place I love is Market Basket because they're like old school and I love that. You <laughs> walk in, you fill out a hand-filled out application. You can't <laughs> even do it online and they'll interview you right there. Okay. That's amazing because a lot of our veterans, like we don't get all the young, young ones. We right. get them in the 50s and 60s and a lot of them don't have computer skills to apply for the job online. And if they're homeless, how are they gonna apply for the job online? Right. And I'm telling other agencies, yes, you don't wanna enable them, you don't wanna like, you, you wanna teach them as much as you can, but if they're living out in a tent, they can't apply for this job. You're gonna have to do it for them. Right, and absolutely. I mean, I do it for them, but I also make them responsible to call the agencies back. Like, here you go, I you applied for this right. job for you online, we, we discuss it, we, I mean, they have to give me their resume information, and yep. I got a new, really great one. I'll have to show you that I've been doing. It's really <laughs> pops. Yep. So, because uh, one of my veterans, Bryant, had a similar one. I'm like, I'm gonna start doing that, and people are calling. Yeah. And I'm like, I've seen there's so many jobs available, and I'm like, where are all the workers gone? Like, right. unemployment's not there anymore. So where are they? Why aren't they working? That's what I want to know. It's right. like it's scary. So. So if someone knows a veteran, or they are a veteran, or they work with a veteran. Yep. Um, what's a way for them to contact you to get more information about this? They program? can just call Harbor Care's main number, and it will get okay. to me. And uh, we have. Um, they can go on the website, and we have uh, a general email uh, that comes to all of us. It comes to Peter, and then Wendy gives it to everybody, whoever mm -hmm. whoever it needs to. So just go on our website or dial the main number, the six zero three eight eight two three six one six number. And right. it'll get to whoever you need. So a lot of times people will call me and I'm like, yeah, that's this person. That's this person. But that's fine. I don't mind. Right. And then my stand down, September 23rd. So that's a good way to. Uh, yeah, you have the stand down. Yep. To meet people. So explain to the audience kind of what the stand down is. So a stand down started back way back when veterans started coming home and they didn't have resumes and jobs. It started in San Diego. Mm -hmm. And th what they did is it was a big event to, to have housing and employment, uh, resume writing, um, mm -hmm. benefits, um, right. whatever they needed. And so I know some do like two to three day ones, but we do a one day one. And right now we have we have 50, um, we call them service providers that are going to be coming. And I just got an eye doctor, but I'm still looking for like a hot dog vendor or somebody like that that wants to donate. Um, and I can give them a little bit of money because I have like um, some food for the veterans. I could use cots, but that's been, everybody's been asking me for those lately. Cots. cots. Okay. Yeah. Cause I have a lot of, and uh, the, the veteran VA was going to order for me, but you, you get these big surface things and it's just kind of whatever hodgepodge they can find. So right. we decided not to do that this year, but like we have suicide prevention coming. Now we have the eye doctor, which was a great piece. We have COVID shots that we're going to be doing. Uh, Sylvia from the clinic's going to be up there doing things. 
and we have our housing programs and now we have uh bill jolly who um does the mm. veterans medicaid medicare he can help people yep. apply my thing is okay i'm gonna help you apply for that but you got to get a part-time job too so because i right. used to do soar People are like, why are you doing SOAR? You want them to get jobs. Well, they can't always work full time. So. Well, you can also work part time and earn money to supplement your Social Security right. too. So, especially if it's SSDI, uh, I think it's like thirteen up to thirteen hundred right yep. now. Yep. Yep. Um, you also have veterans that are retired. Maybe they still want to supplement their income. Yep. Or even SSDI. You know what? If you start working part time and then you can work, increase it up to full time. Mm -hmm. Why not? Yeah. So what? So what if the SSI goes away? Right. You're earning more than you would have gotten anyway. Right. So. And I always teach them that this is you can still keep your social security, <laughs> okay. and the social security department says we don't try to tell them that, but that's okay. Go ahead. You know, if they right. can work part time and keep their benefits, you know, that's fine because they're afraid to lose those benefits. Yep. And so, what day and time is the stand down, and what's the it's address? It's September twenty third. It's on yep. a Friday. It's at forty five High Street in Nashua, mm -hmm. from ten to two. All right, and that's at the Harbor Care Clinic. Yeah. Uh, it'll be at the Welcoming Light Room and. Um, I'm sure there'll be some stuff outside. Yeah, we're having a band. A band, okay. A full turn band. I think I got that right. <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, my coworker found them. So there'll be a band, and Caitlin's going to be singing the national anthem. She's uh, a, a sweet girl that is just amazing and makes everybody cry. The governor is going to be there, and it's Peter's uh, last hurrah because he's, uh, right. he's the father of our agency. Tell right. them the creator of Harbor Care. <laughs> right. And he's retiring, so that should be interesting. He's been here like 40 years. Right. So if you are a veteran, you want to attend this event, uh, it's 45 High Street, September 23rd, uh, 10 to 3 p.m. Just bring documentation. And if you don't have anything, like a VA card or your DD-214, uh, still come. They'll run your personal information. Um, and what you talked about, the program squares, uh, and just verify your veteran status. So, mm -hmm. Andrea, I uh, appreciate you being a guest on the show today. HVRP is a great program. You're doing great things. You've been doing it for a long time, and mm -hmm. definitely appreciate it. Thank you for watching Changing the Stigma.